explain about some very obscure parts of World War I aviation history. Um, but uh, Steve just gave us this lovely background into number three wing. Uh, so I can tell you a little bit more about that. And it won't be, I think, quite so um, strange when I hit it. Um, the other thing is that this is a modified version of a talk that I gave a couple of times to um, uh, historic, historian conferences. I uh, realized that uh, there are certainly some things I had to explain to them that I might not have to explain to you. Uh, some things that they would understand that I might have to explain to you. Uh, so my apologies in advance uh, if I explain something you don't need explained or don't explain something you do need explained. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, it showed up in the proposal, of course, as U.S. Navy's bombing group. Uh, but when I went back and found my uh, slides that I then modified, I realized I liked my original title better, which was when the American Navy was part of the British Army. And this really does get down to the particular story of the Northern Bombing Group. Uh, so the organization eventually called the Northern Bombing Group, or NBG as I will say, uh, was a curious collection of U.S. Navy and Marine Corps flyers uh, using land-based aircraft to prosecute what today would be called a campaign of strategic bombing. And we'll see how this follows on. Um, like so much of the rest of the U.S. war effort, the armistice ended the war before the MBG really got off the ground, if you'll forgive the pun. Uh, by that time, however, circumstances resulted in these naval aviators treading on the toes of the Army's air service by supporting the British and, and uh, Belgian and French armies around Flanders. Uh, something the Navy Department had promised from the outset, the War Department, that they would not do. Uh, so this interesting juxtaposition of naval aviators flying what were considered army missions in what were army planes uh, is a story of path dependency and complex contingency. So path dependency, sort of what it sounds like if you take one path that sort of limits what you can then do. Uh, contingency is really historians speak for stuff happening. Um, so... Uh, this also provides a little bit of perspective on U.S. Army aviation, what they did during the war, although that is not part of my presentation today. Uh, it is in my dissertation, which should be available, uh, I think, beginning of next month. Um, anyway, story today is effectively two parts. Uh, the first part involves a lot of thinking, but not much doing. Uh, the second part, things happen fast. Much is going on, and it doesn't leave time for thinking. Uh, so... What was the Northern Bombing Group? Well, as part of the U.S. World War I anti-submarine campaign, the U.S. Navy, with the assistance of the British and to a lesser extent the Italians, began in 1918 to organize squadrons of land-based day and night bombers to attack German U-boats in their bases. Ah, I do have that. Um, Allied, naval Allied naval leadership expected that the round-the-clock bombing of the submarine bases and the captured Belgian ports of Ostend, Zeebrugge, and Bruges, which you can see here, uh, would not only sink submarines outright, and it would damage necessary stores and facilities for refueling, rearming, and repair. Such damage would restrict the German ability to prosecute the U-boat uh, war. Uh, restrict the German ability to prepare returning U-boats uh, to prepare them for another patrol, and so reduce the total number of U-boat patrols. The Navy eventually authorized this project uh, and designated these squadrons the Northern Bombing Group. Now, the earliest origins of the Northern Bombing Group are, in fact, British, and here is where number three wing comes in. Um, in 1914, when, war out, uh, when the, the, the war breaks out, uh, the Royal Flying Corps is very small, and all of it is needed in northern France to support the British Expeditionary Forces. <coughs> By default, the Royal Naval Air Service is left behind and takes over aerial defense of the home islands. Now, the Royal Navy has this long tradition of striking fleets in their bases, i.e. not waiting for them to come out and then attacking. Um, and basically applied the same tendency to their planning to defend uh, the homeland against these Zeppelin raids. So, uh, the Royal Navy experiments early on with some sea-launched raids in the North Sea against the Zeppelin home bases uh, in northern, German, northern Germany, Dusseldorf, Cuxhaven, and Wilhelmshaven, uh, beginning in late 1914. And in fact, this is where we see the origins of 
uh, British development of what will become known as carriers. Uh, there are also some interesting stunts that they pull that I'm not going to get into today. Uh, however, in February 1915, the Royal Naval Air Service was beginning its first bombing raids on these Flanders U-boat bases. This leads to the idea, well, rather than bombing uh, the, uh, well, sorry, getting back to the issue of Zeppelins, uh, rather than bombing the Zeppelin fields, why not bomb Zeppelin manufacturing? And this is actually the idea that eventually becomes number three wing. By the time number three wing is deployed, its mission is very different. But, uh, and uh, again, the issue with the maps, I did this in a couple of hours yesterday afternoon. <laughs> um, so again, Lucille uh, were their headquarters, and the idea is the, uh, the Zeppelin base here at Friedrichshafen, right there on the point of the oddly shaped thing. Um, and so attack manufacturing, uh, and so protect against uh, strategic bombing of the British Isles by eliminating production of these strategic bombers. Uh, of course, as it eventually established, it is working with the French uh, to attack the iron industry in the Tsar Lorraine Luxembourg area, and uh, the RAF official history of the war uh, says that um, this is actually related back to the U-boat campaign, uh, which is the idea was that by striking this um, basic metal manufacturing process, they would actually reduce the number of U-boats that could be built. Uh, so really long range <coughs> stuff here. Um, Anyway, as Steve said, uh, the RNAS produced, uh, purchased rather, uh, SOP with one and a half strutters for its daylight bombing. And um, when the idea of striking the Zeppelin bases, the Zeppelin manufacturing in Friedrichshafen came up, this is actually the origin of the Hanley Page, uh, what becomes the O100. Um, and uh, again, I think as Steve pointed out, it's significant that it's the Navy asking for this. Um, so uh, there are problems, as Steve already uh, covered. Um, in particular, Trenchard, head of the RFC, opposes the mission of the wing. He doesn't think that, uh, that this is actually having much effect on the outcome of the war. And he's jealous of all of those one and a half strutters, although the, the details you gave apparently the pilots more than the planes. Uh, although this does feed into the eventual merger uh, amalgamation of the, uh, the RNAS and the RFC uh, because the Navy had a uh, sole contract uh, for the one and a half strutter. So the, uh, the RFC, if they wanted them, had to buy them through the Navy and this causes problems. Um, in any event, uh, so RFC opposes the mission of the wing. Uh, bad weather over that winter limits their effectiveness and shortages of planes uh, for the the, the number three wing also leads to the low numbers uh, of missions. Again, the 0100s only start getting delivered towards the end. Um, but again, some of those one and a half strutters uh, are being siphoned back off to the, uh, the, the Royal Flying Corps. Um, so it never really gets up to authorized strength before it is disbanded. Significant part of this is that the CO and two of the officers, Commanding Officer uh, Charles Lamb, uh, Senior Officer Spencer Gray, and uh, it's, I believe he's Lieutenant Lord Tiverton, um, are part of number three wing. Tiverton is uh, tangentially important to the story as, as uh, really developing the beginnings of what's now called operational research. Tiverton is the guy figuring out what they need to hit, how often they need to hit it in order to have the greatest effect. So he's really the mastermind behind number three wing strategic bombing campaign. All three of these go north with the uh, Hanley Page squadrons, which Trenchard doesn't want because he doesn't want to do this long distance bombing, and that's really the only thing these are good for. Uh, so the three of them go north to form part of number five wing, which uh, again, we will get back to. Uh, so January 1917, uh, Germany resumes its unrestricted submarine warfare campaign with an unexpected ferocity. It had backed off earlier in the war after U.S. protestations. Um, however, the Germans uh, 
at this point are, are, are pushed into a corner and they realize if they're going to win, they need to end this war quickly. And they see a massive surge in unrestricted submarine warfare as a possibility. And their, their hope, really more than their expectation, is that uh, they recognize that if they do this, it's going to bring the U.S. into the war. But their hope is that they can do enough damage quickly enough to push the British and French, bring them to the peace table, have them sue for peace, before the U.S. can bring its military might to bear. Um, which does happen, but not quite the way they thought it would. Anyway, um, so number five wing is formed, as I say, uh, to help address this new problem. And, and uh, French and British and Italians, all of them really un unprepared for this resumption in submarine warfare. Um, so as I say, number five wing is created to attack these U-boat bases in occupied Belgium. Uh, however, the, uh, the war ministry back in London had decreed that these units uh, will be committed to assisting the Royal Flying Corps and the British Army uh, as needed. And um, I believe this is after the Smuts Report, which comes out, what, beginning of 17, late 16? No, off the top of your head. Uh, no, no, it would have been like the fall of 1917 after the Gotha summer. Oh, right. I'm sorry, you're right. I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting a year like ahead of myself here. Um, so it, even before that, however, uh, the expectation is that these uh, RNAS planes will be helping the RFC as needed. Uh, so again, we see this, this tension between the two services. In any event, uh, this resumption in anti-submarine warfare does bring the U.S. into the war, 6 April 1917, uh, and it is a direct result of the German resumption of this. Um, now, the British already stretched thin in resources, the French also, even thinner in resources, uh, sending everything to the Western Front. They really have no spare capacity to address this anti-submarine threat, or uh, the submarine threat. They have no nothing to send into uh, uh, ASW. Um, and so both the British and the French see the U.S. as uncommitted resources. That, of course, they want to help on the Western Front, but they also really want uh, the U.S. to sort of take over as much as possible this ASW campaign. Um, so, the basic idea, the main thread, is this British development of the idea. Uh, now at this point I want to pick up two other threads. We have uh, our Americans come into the system. Uh, we have here Captain Alfred Cunningham of the Marine Corps and Lieutenant Robert Lovett, the United States Naval Reserve Flying Corps. Um, both apparently working, at least initially, without knowledge of the other, also apparently working without knowledge of what the British were already doing. So, first of all, Cunningham uh, gets his idea on a return from touring aviation schools in France at the end of 1917. Uh, we will loop back to this, but he is actually looking for a mission, uh, an independent mission for sort of newly created Marine Corps aviation. He's got these aviators. He thought they were going to be supporting uh, the Marine 2nd Brigade. Uh, the U.S. Air Service said, no, we're not going to let you do that. And again, the reasons why I'm not going to get into here. But um, Cunningham wanted a distinct Marine Corps mission. Uh, and part of the visit was hoping to change their minds. Part of it was looking for what else can we do. Uh, so on his return from France, uh, he is riding a British destroyer on the way back and happens to see a chart of the sea off the Belgian coast. Uh, and this is a modern chart, so you can see if you wondered why Bruges was a target, uh, you can see the, uh, the canal that still exists. Uh, there was also a canal connecting it to Ostend, which seems to have fallen into modern disrepair. Uh, but for those of you not used to reading nautical charts, uh, what we see here, these dark blue areas, is very, very shallow water. Any submarine transiting this area would have to remain surfaced. Uh, this is, this mid blue is sort of the next level. Uh, submarines could transit this at a wash or basically just below the surface. So still very, very visible to an aircraft. And in particular, uh, getting in and out of Zeebrugge would have to transit this very narrow canal. And it's really only once they get out past this last bank that they would be able to dive deeply and escape. So Cunningham looks at this. 
and says, oh, this is a fantastic place to attack German submarines going in and out of port. Uh, and the destroyer crew tells him, yes, we had the same thought. Uh, the Germans have set up uh, land-based fighters uh, around, uh, on, along the coast of Belgium uh, for this very reason, to keep the slow-moving seaplanes that the British were using uh, from getting in and, and bombing with impunity. Uh, between that, between um, uh, shore defenses, shore guns, keeping destroyers uh, well off the coast, uh, the British said, no, we, we really can't attack anything in here. Um, Cunningham, however, says, no, there's a way to do it. My Marines will fly fighter protection for the slow-moving Navy seaplanes to go in and bomb submarines here. Now, Lovett uh, is training in Europe at about the same time for eventual command of a U.S. Coastal Seaplane Patrol Station in France. Uh, as part of this training, he's working with the British flying out of Felixstowe um, and flying what was colloquially known as the Spiderweb Patrols. Uh, there is a light ship at the center of this, and they were basically given sectors, uh, and they would do sort of paths like this. Um, and again, somebody had figured out uh, if you send so many patrols out, uh, you cover much of this area. Um, and again, we've got the submarines coming uh, from the U-boats, the U-boat uh, bases down here, uh, basically transiting north around um, the, the British Isles. So this was a good place to catch them. Um, so Lovett is participating in these patrols, and it is while flying these patrols, uh, he begins thinking about the logistics of U-boat operations, and in this he's drawing on his own personal knowledge. His father is a senior person with, uh, I believe it's the New York Central Railroad. Lovett himself has a lot of background in railroad operations. He knows that for every engine out on the line, there are two or three uh, in reserve or being repaired, um, and he applies this to the U-boat and realizes that uh, if the Germans have about 300 to 350 submarines, only about 50 of them are actually in the Atlantic at any given moment in time. Uh, the rest are in transit or repair, rest, restocking for the next mission. The vast majority of them are going to be in port. And so he says, uh, he also looks at the spider web, how many hours are flown, how many submarines are sighted, how many attacks are made, how many are successful. Uh, and realizes that it's showing quite a lot of effort for each U-boat spotted, and only a minuscule number of those spotted are attacked, much less successfully. Uh, and so Lovett says it makes much more sense to uh, put all of this effort into attacking them where they are. The, the phrase that comes out in the recent uh, Rosano and Wildenberg book, striking the hornets in their nests. Everyone is throwing this phrase around at the time. Um, so we have these three threads. Uh, of the two Americans, Cunningham had the idea slightly earlier than Lovett and had the advantage of working in Washington. He headed back to uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, his destroyer ride was on the 29th of December, 1917. He is back in Washington, 17 January, 1918, and presents his idea before the Navy's general board, a, a senior uh, officer planning organization, uh, on February 5th. Uh, on February 25th, so just about two weeks later, the General Board approves Cunningham's plan for the Navy to operate 30 seaplane bombers protected by 64 land plane fighters to eventually grow to 200 fighters out of northern France with the idea of attacking U-boats in the shallows off the Belgian coast. The fighters were necessary both to establish, uh, air, or to establish air superiority off the coast both through patrol and escort, but also through directly attacking the German uh, fighter bases. March 5th, 1918, Admiral William Benson, the Chief of Naval Operations, newly created, it just established in 1915. Uh, Benson sends an order to Admiral William Sims, who at this point is commander of naval forces in Europe, ordering Sims to prepare air bases for four squadrons of aircraft, presumably four uh, Cunningham's plan. Now, Lovett uh, is assigned to Felix, though, in Jan early January 1918. Uh, and he develops this at some point while he's at Felix, though, uh, 
Uh, at the end of January 1918, he is assigned to Captain Hutch I. Cohn's uh, naval air staff in Paris. Cohn is in charge of all naval aviation in Europe. Um, working under Sims, uh, but recognizing that uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, anti-submarine patrol stations that the U.S. has taken over are actually in France, and so operating out of Paris makes more sense. So Lovett is assigned there. Here he reunites with uh, Navy Lieutenant, regular Navy Lieutenant, Eddie McDonnell. McDonnell had been the regular Navy officer uh, who trained the first Yale unit, of which Lovett had been a part. Um, and uh, the two of them are actually roommates in Paris. And uh, McDonnell begins assisting Lovett in developing these ideas for attacking the, the, um, the forward operating bases. Also in Paris, Lovitz meets up with Wing Commander Spencer Gray, uh, who at the time is attached to Edgar Gorell's staff in the U.S. Air Service, and is beginning to be um, disillusioned at the lack of movement on the Air Service's part towards strategic aviation. Uh, Gray is considered an expert in bombing, uh, and his major contribution, uh, direct contribution, uh, is actually changing the nature of Lovett's ideas. Lovett had expected that this bombing would be carried out with the big Navy seaplanes that he was used to, the Felixstowe F-2A and the Curtis H-12, both of which were flying out of Felixstowe. Um, at the time, it was taken as given that any sort of seaplane was a Navy plane, any sort of land plane was an Army plane. And so it makes perfect sense that Lovett was thinking he'd be using these big seaplanes. Gray comes back and convinces Lovett that rather than these really slow lumbering aircraft, uh, he should instead be using these slightly faster lumbering aircraft. <laughs> um, convinces him that he should be using land plane bombers, that the Royal Naval Air Service had already switched over the Hanley Page, the O-100, the O-400 was already on the drawing boards. Um, and... Uh, the, the more indirect, Gray introduces Lovett and McDonald to Wing Captain uh, Lamb, who is commanding the RNAS squadrons in northern France. Um, so in uh, the, what am I looking at here? Uh, I think this is February, late February, Lovett submits a memo to Cohn outlining his plans for bombing the Belgian U-boat bases with land planes making a very distinct argument that land planes are going to replace seaplanes in the future anyway. Uh, and so for the Navy to do this is not an anomaly, it's forward-looking. Uh, Cohn forwards the memo to Sims in London, and here is where the two American ideas collide in March. Uh, Sims is the first person to have both of them on the desk at his, same, at his desk at the same time. So uh, Sims writes back to the general board on March 23rd, 1918, endorsing the recommendations that he's gotten from Cohn, that is, Lovett's ideas. He says that the board should modify its program of attacking submarines in the offshore shallows to uh, instead change over to a continuous day and night bombing of the submarine bases. Um, and this leads to an interesting concern from Washington. Washington looks at this and says the department's idea was that operations should be directed against submarines in their bases and Sims' intention is to operate directly against the bases. From a modern perspective, this is a very subtle and fine line, but it was a very important one to this Army-Navy issue. Again, if the submarines are in the water, that is clearly a Navy target. If the base has, if you're, if you're attacking buildings on the land, that would seem to be an Army target. Um, and so the, the Navy is, uh, expresses a concern that this operation could tread on the Army's toes, uh, and in particular that the Army could then use this as an excuse to take over naval aviation. The Navy doesn't want to spend all of this money only to have the Army come in and say, yeah, we'll take it from here. Oh, by the way, give us all of your planes and your pilots. Um, after thinking about it, though, they realized that the distinction is indeed a very fine one and that it would be practically impossible to bomb submarines at the bases without also striking the bases, and further concludes uh, that there is very little risk of an Army takeover. And uh, this issue of striking submarines without striking the bases, uh, this is actually a, a British reconnaissance photo uh, of Bruges 
March 9th. Uh, and I have attempted to outline, because it doesn't show up very well, even with this size, uh, the submarines. Up here, though, you see the submarine pens. Here's a, a post-war view of those. Again, presaging a lot of what happens in World War II. Anyway, uh, on April 4th, 1918, the Navy Department in Washington agrees to modify its plans. However, the agreement is to use the land plane bombers in addition to, not instead of, attacking U-boats and shallows with flying boats. So they've kind of merged these two rather than replacing one with the other. In the meantime, uh, Cone assigns McDonnell and Lovett to work with Lamb directly up with number five group to learn more about how the British are running their operations. Uh, McDonnell is up there for about two weeks and Lovett is with uh, number five group for several months. During this time, the two of them participate in all aspects of RNAS operations, both day and night bombing, flying along on combat missions. Um, McDonnell in particular is there long enough, I think he, he flies as co-pilot on, uh, on some of the later missions when he's there. Both submit reports with more detailed recommendations for what becomes the NBG, and both include direct offers from LAM for the RNAS to assist the Navy in getting this going. Again, we see this desire by the Royal Navy, the RNAS, uh, which by this point is getting ready to merge, uh, amalgamate uh, with the RFC into the RAF. Uh, but this desire to sort of, we can't do this, the Americans can, let's make sure they do it. Uh, by early April, Washington is beginning to come around to Sim's point of view. Uh, but there is still this concern about treading on the Army's toes. So on April 4th, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Josephus Daniels, writes to Secretary of War Baker about the Navy's plans to bomb the U-boat pens uh, and wants to know specifically, does the Army agree that these missions are, quote, entirely of a naval character? If the Army agrees, can they supply some of the planes that the Navy would need? The Army doesn't agree. Is the Army prepared to do this themselves? Um, and I think it, it may be the second one as much as the first one. That on April 10th, uh, Baker writes back, no, no, I'm moving ahead. All right, uh, Baker writes back that the War Department does consider these to be Navy missions and says uh, that the, US, the uh, Army can deliver some day bombers in the U.S. by October, however, can supply absolutely nothing to the Navy in Europe and they suggest getting in touch with General John Pershing to arrange for some European orders to be turned over to the Army. Um, this is the first time that the AEF is finding out about this, and at this time, Brigadier General Benjamin Folloy is in charge of the U.S. Air Service and objects strenuously both to the basic Navy plan and to the idea of turning over Army planes to the Navy, because again, U.S. Air Service is in desperate need of planes, isn't getting enough. However, is overruled by Pershing at Washington's direct direction, uh, which ends the immediate problem but does nothing to solve a lot of the tensions between the U.S. Army and Navy in northern France, or even in all of Europe. Um, and once again, there is this concern that the Navy is using land planes, that this will give the Army an excuse to take them over, but again decides that the risk is small, because again, even if the War Department uh, backs Folloy and, and Pershing, who initially is also opposed to this, um, the War Department recognizes that this is a mission that needs to be done. And if the Army takes over the resources, this mission is not going to happen because the Army is going to direct them all towards the Western Front, not the U-boat war. So, uh, April 30th, Daniels officially authorizes six squadrons each of day and night bombers. Uh, and decides that the marine aviators are going to fly the day bombers instead of uh, covering fighter craft. Benson states at this point his belief that the Northern Bombing Group is the most important thing yet undertaken by naval aviation and advises all Navy Europe's uh, bureaus to give what is then known as the Dunkirk Bombing Project priority. Um, at the end of May, due to problems supplying airplanes and men, the Navy Department reduces their immediate plans uh, from a total of 12 squadrons to a total of 8 squadrons. Um, part of the problem is that naval aviation itself, while it has grown tremendously, 
uh, is still struggling with its own manpower problems to man about a dozen coastal uh, naval air stations in France and another four in Ireland. Um, and so the manning of night squadrons proceeds only slowly, with the first air crew beginning to trickle in at the beginning of June 1918. On uh, June the 1st, Navy leaves seaplane operations to the existing Coastal Patrol NASs. The Dunkirk project drops the use of the seaplanes. It will be land planes only. And here we see that the Marines specifically are going to fly the day squadrons, and the Navy will fly the night squadrons. Now, the Navy is slow to assemble personnel, but the Marines are in much better shape. Remember, uh, Alfred Cunningham, as soon as the U.S. gets into the war, begins assembling a, uh, a Marine Corps Air Organization. Uh, when the war started, uh, he was one of five Marine Corps pilots, uh, and the Marine Corps had no planes of its own. So he sees this as an opportunity, uh, and has begun building this, initially, as I said, with the idea that it's going to support uh, the Marine Brigade in Europe, um, and is, is quite disillusioned when the Army refuses to let him do this. Very frustrated when the Army says, no, we intend for you to uh, take over a training base. You're going to be training cadre. He says, no, 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 we're not doing that. Uh, so he's got all these aviators in training, uh, but with no particular mission until now. Um, and so uh, as a result of these other plans falling through, these aviators are kept together through training. And uh, three squadrons are ready uh, to deploy almost instantly on July 30th. They, they arrived in France on July 30th um, to find out that nobody knew they were coming or where they're supposed to go. Um, in any event, uh, the name Northern Bombing Group finally becomes official at the beginning of August. At the end of August, uh, personnel, mostly Marine Corps, but some of the few Navy guys who have started to show up, uh, begin working and flying with their counterpart British squadrons under Lamb. Now this is partially a result of Lamb's offer to Lovett and McDonald to help the Navy get up to speed. However, it's also organizational. As a result of Sims' policy of integrating Navy forces with Allied commands, the complete opposite of what Pershing wants to do, the Northern Bombing Group is formally part of Graham's, uh, uh, Lamb's now RAF number no. 5 wing, which is all the former Royal Naval Air Service squadrons in northern France. Um, so we've got people, more Marines than aviators, uh, but planes, not surprisingly, continue to be a problem. Lovett early on had identified the Caproni as the ideal uh, aircraft to be used, and the Navy had planned to get its Capronis from Italy. However, this leads to more conflict with the U.S. Air Service. Uh, the Navy had established a separate contract, part of which included the delivery of raw materials, spruce, um, uh, doping material, linen, um, some finished or semi-finished uh, metal items. Um, the Air Service actually already had a contract with Caproni to buy planes, but was having a hard time getting the supplies delivered. And so they see the Navy as undercutting the Army, both A, competing uh, directly and driving up the price, uh, but also B, that they've somehow stolen a march by being able to deliver the raw materials on Navy ships, uh, which the Army uh, uh, doesn't have that. So uh, Army and Navy then have to settle the problem, which is not helped by the fact that the Army representative in Italy at the time is one Fiorello, Fiorello LaGuardia, um, <laughs> and not known for compromising. Um, anyway, uh, so the Navy and the Army settle this out. The Navy agrees we will split production between the two of us. We will continue to bring over supplies for both Army and Navy aircraft. Uh, the Navy gets about 19 of these delivered and begins uh, ferrying these aircraft to northern France, uh, flying up. Uh, northern Italy, into France, and around the back way. Uh, however, this reveals the other problem that comes up. When Lovett had decided on the Caproni, he had seen earlier uh, what was at the time known as the Caproni 450 with the Soda Fraschini engines. Uh, Fiat was beginning to attempt American-style mass production, and it wasn't going well. And it showed in the 200 horsepower engines that were going to supply the uh, Caproni 600s. 
so three to 200 horsepower engines. Um, basically all variants on the, on the CA3. Uh, this poor assembly of Fiat engines led to them being underpowered and causing many of them to catch fire when they crashed. Uh, and this includes one that crashes on takeoff from the Italian field where it's delivered to the Navy. Um, of the 18 that the Navy attempted to fly from Italy to the northern uh, fields of the northern bombing group at San Ingolfert, only eight arrived safely. And it occurred to me as I was looking at this, I'm not sure if that eight that arrived safely includes the one that landed safely, but ran into a boggy patch trying to taxi to the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the hangars. The pilot decided he was going to gun the engines and force it out. Uh, the plane ended up nosing over, which caused gasoline to spill over the hot engines. The entire crew died. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, with this in mind, the Navy declared that the 19th plane that they had taken delivery of would be boxed up and put on a ship. <laughs> <laughs> and that future deliveries would be shipped until we could figure out why these things were happening. Uh, in any event, this meant that the Navy was having problems getting Capronis. And of the eight, or possibly seven, that arrived, uh, I think two of them were uh, flight-worthy on the night of August 15th, one of which immediately turned around with engine problems, meaning that uh, the only independent night raid made by the Northern Bombing Group was on August 15th, when one Caproni bombed Ostend. For the day wing, the day wing was expected to use U.S.-built DH-4s. I'm sure you're all familiar with the claims that were made about how many DH-4s the U.S. auto industry would be making. And of course, there were problems with that. They were beginning to be solved by the time the, the, the Marines got over there. However, the DH-4s that were being delivered, uh, some of them were being lost in transit. They were directed to the wrong ports. Uh, the boxes that came, parts were mixed up. Um, some of the aircraft arrived damaged. Um, all of them needed to be updated once they arrived. Uh, changes that the Europeans, that the British had discovered needed to be made to, to make these more survivable, more useful in combat. Uh, so that even once the planes arrive, there are further delays as they are prepared. Um, so what are they going to do? The one success that the US had was the construction of engines. The Liberty 12s are fantastic. We're actually shipping more of these to Europe than we have airplanes to put into. The British, Sims notice, have the opposite problems. They've got plenty of airframes, but their engine production is delayed. Sims talks with the Admiralty uh, and then the, the, the newly created RAF command um, and, and cuts a deal. He says uh, the US will deliver three engines, for every three engines that the US delivers to the British. The British will take one of them, install it in an aircraft, and return that complete aircraft to the U.S. Um, this is going to happen both with DH-9s, which are the, the supposedly updated version of the DH-4s, as well as Hanley Pages. Um, the U.S. Uh, Northern Bombing Group gets none of these Liberty-powered Hanley Pages by the end of the war, but does begin getting these Liberty Engine DH-9s. Um, about the same time that the actual U.S. built DH-4s are also arriving. Uh, so the first Marine aircraft, remember they've been flying uh, initially with British air crew. At some point they take over spare British planes. Um, the first Marine aircraft flies with RAF 218 on October 1st, bombing rail yards at Lichterfeld, Belgium. Um, and again, this is, I think, as much in sort of a strategic interdiction of uh, the German forces on the, the Flanders front as it is strategic inter interdiction of supplies going to the forward U-boat bases. Uh, it is not until October 14, that the 14th that the Marines have enough aircraft to fly their own independent mission as the Northern Bombing Group Day Wing. Uh, the target is more rail yards at Thiel, Belgium. Uh, and again, of the missions that the Marine Day Wing flies, uh, they, are, they are more in, the, in the, the range of interdiction attacks. And in fact, I'm not certain whether they did actually make any direct attacks on any of the U-boat bases. In any event, uh, this is September that this is starting out. Uh, late September, events begin to happen quickly, uh, which shift the Northern Bombing Group even further to support of the Allied armies. 
Uh, in particular, the Allied counterattack in Flanders causes the German forces to retreat, abandoning the forward U-boat bases in Belgium and taking away the stated purpose of the Northern Bombing Group. Uh, this forces a shift of the MBG even further towards Army-type missions. And again, remember that they are part of Number 5 Wing, which at this point is under the command of the British Army. Um, so most Number 5 Group missions, again, are, are in support of the British Army even more at this point. Uh, the Night Wing is still waiting for planes. The Day Wing is now flying exclusively in support of ground forces, uh, while individual U.S. aircraft, both day and night wings, or, or air crew, uh, continue to fly with the RAF on RAF missions in RAF planes. Uh, by this point, the U.S. seaplane station at Dunkirk was abandoned as a seaplane station, uh, and command is transferred to the Northern Bombing Group. Uh, the pilots from Dunkirk, while waiting for a new mission, while waiting for planes, are assigned to French and British fighter groups supporting Allied armies in Flanders, and this is where we get uh, uh, the exploits of naval aviators David Engel Eng yeah, Ingalls and Kenneth McLeish. Um, so, there are expectations that the Northern Bombing Group will finally get enough planes between Hanley Pages, the re-engine Capronis, and more DH-4s and DH-9s, uh, that they will get enough planes to have a real impact on the war by late November. Uh, likely their missions would have been more in more support of the Allied armies in northern France. However, at the beginning of November, uh, the RAF squadrons are transferred to RAF 83 Wing, part of Trenchard's independent force down in the south. Uh, number 5 group itself is disbanded and the Northern Bombing Group is cast adrift from the command structure. Uh, the Northern Bombing Group is offered to Pershing, who declines, uh, perhaps thinking uh, both of the organizational problems of getting the NBG from north and south, uh, as well as trying to operate Navy and Army personnel side by side. Um, in any event, uh, he declines the offer, and at the end of the war, uh, the Navy is negotiating to attach the NBG directly to the Supreme Command of the Allied Armies. Um, again, this is, this is an independent force with the British independent force is going to be part of uh, the, the international, I forget the exact Inter -allied. title. Inter-Allied. Inter thank you, bombing force. Um, however, of course, the armistice suddenly ends all of this planning. Uh, so... Um, Despite the concerns of the Navy when organizing the Northern Bombing Group, uh, the, that the unit, to the extent it was able, uh, would not be doing Army-type missions, uh, that is, in fact, what they ended the war doing. Uh, close air support and interdiction missions in support of British, French, and Belgian armies in Flanders, including the Marines participating in some of the first uh, aerial supply drops uh, in Flanders. Um, and... Had the war not ended quite suddenly, the Northern Bombing Group would likely have done even more such work. Uh, the Marines during the war gained some immediately relevant experience in supporting ground forces, experience that they applied immediately after the war in places like Haiti and El Salvador. However, the Navy never did anything like this again. They turned their back completely on any lessons they might have taken from this. Um, and as we all know, during World War II, uh, the attack on German forward bases in France was left entirely to the Army Air Services at the time. So, uh, just to conclude, the development of a U.S. Naval Aviation Force and its gradual shift to support the, of the British Army is a complex story involving both path dependencies, uh, specifically the decision to attach to Number 5 Group, and multiple contingencies, especially the German retreat from the Belgian ports. Uh, the desire to attack the wasps in their nests, the thin line between bombing subs in port and bombing the ports themselves, uh, the ability of the RNAS to develop heavy bombers, the formation of the RAF and its inclusion of former RNAS squadrons, each of these steps in the process of evolution from a unit of seaplanes attacking U-boats off the Belgian coast to land planes, uh, supported practicing what we would now call strategic interdiction, um, each of these steps is perfectly logical and justifiable. 
And yet, the complete chain of events resulted in this irony of the U.S. Navy doing exactly what it promised the U.S. Army it would not do, infringe on Army aviation's mission by using land planes to attack land targets in support of an army. Thank you.